Good evening. I think it was last week, you know, we have, we have undercover security guys in our church. Uh, they're just watching out for us. <clears throat> One of them came up to me last Sunday and said, you look like a guy that needs to be frisked. I, I don't know. I don't know what I, I try not to look that way, but apparently there's something about me. I can't tell you how thrilled we are to be here in Des Moines, Iowa. We just still pinch ourselves. And uh, it, it's just been an amazing journey and an incredible cycle for us in life and in ministry. We're thrilled to be here in Des Moines, to be a part of New Hope, to be able to work with a great staff God has put together. Pastor Weaver is wonderful, and Pastor Jeff, and all the pastors. I just love and appreciate each and every one of them. Uh, Pastor Weaver at times, though, is given to what I call uh, hyperbolic statements. Uh, <clears throat> like uh, uh, he, he said this morning, I, I was a preaching machine. Not quite true. Not quite true. Uh, if I'm a machine, I'm a machine that breaks down from time to time, that grinds and groans and often malfunctions. Uh, 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 and I need a lot of replacement parts, I think. Uh, being a machine's not all it's cracked up to be. I was in the bedroom the other day, and I was groaning and making some pretty loud noises, and my wife said, Don, are you okay? I said, yeah, I'm just putting my socks on. <laughs> Absolute truth. Anybody here? Do you really? Oh, I'm so thankful to hear that. How reassuring. I don't like to suffer alone. And... Uh, I don't know. I'm not saying I'm glad that you go through those agonies in life, but it's, I guess, a part of life. Kind of reminds me of the uh, story I heard. You know, that's probably the most commonly used line of a preacher. It reminds me of a story I heard. A story of a southern evangelist. He was going all over the south. In fact, I, I think he was from Texas. And um, he... <laughs> as the story would go, and, and he's, he's all over the south. He's at the, he's at the prime of his ministry, and he's never had such great responses and so many large crowds, and he's preaching all over the south, and, but he gets sick, and he goes to the doctor, and he says, Doctor, I'm just not feeling good. He said, Can you help me? And the doctor checked him over and said, Yeah, I can help you. He said, I'm going to give you a shot. That'll make you feel better. He said, Drop your pants. And he said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to give you a shot in the hip. Oh, no, 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 doctor, you can't. You don't understand, doctor. I'm a Pentecostal preacher, and when we preach, he said, we use our feet. We use our legs. I like to stop. He said, I like to walk back and forth, and sometimes I even run a little bit. You can't give me a shot in the hip. Well, the doctor was amused by this Pentecostal preacher's antics, and he looked at him, and he thought, well, roll up your sleeve. He said, well, what are you going to do, doctor? He said, I'm going to give you a shot in the arm. Oh, no, doctor, you can't do that. He said, he said, don't you understand? I'm Pentecostal. He said, when I preach, I love to use my arms. I swing my arms, and I like to point at sinners. The doctor is now not amused, but he's annoyed by this preacher. He's got to give him a shot. So he looks at him and he said, well, tell me, Reverend, is there a portion of your anatomy that you don't use when you preach? He thought for a minute, he said, yes, sir, you can shoot me right here. <laughs> well, I may use my arms and may use my legs. I hope I can use some of this as well. Tonight, I want to talk to you about virtues for voters. Virtues for voters. How many have already voted? I voted last week. Felt good. Enjoyed it. How many haven't voted yet? Many of you have. I would say most of you have, but how many are going to vote? Ah, that's wonderful. Glad to hear that. Well, I want to look at 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13 for a little springboard tonight to help us put all of this in perspective. Now, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. 
The issues are too great not to vote in this election. I'm afraid we've gotten so absorbed in and distracted by the personalities in the election, we have forgotten the platform of the individual parties. I encourage you to give that the most serious consideration. Both parties have a record and a platform that tell us what we can expect from them regarding a multitude of issues. So please, if you haven't studied that, get online, find out what their official stands are regarding the Supreme Court appointees, religious liberty, abortion, marriage, immigration, um, Israel, the economy, national security. All those issues are very important. But having said that, there are other issues that we can lose sight of in the heat of the battle, and I'm afraid we've often done that very thing. We are Christians first, then Democrats or Republicans or whatever our political persuasions might be. Let me suggest that we keep these three virtues in mind as we we thankfully end up this political season. By the way, how many are glad it's coming to an end? Yeah, none too quickly. First of all, faith. Faith in God. Faith in God. Now, these three remain faith. We're not talking about faith in fate or faith in faith or faith in politicians or political parties or faith in government. No, we're talking about a very special and specific kind of faith, we're talking about a faith in the living God who is above all political parties and whose kingdom will outlast all the kingdoms of this world. I don't know how long America will last. We hope for a long, long time. I'm reading my second 1,000-page book about Hitler, and he talked about a thousand-year reign. Well, it didn't happen, not the way he envisioned. I don't know how long America is going to live, but I can promise you this, it's temporary. It's not eternal. Now, we're all anxious about the upcoming election, who's going to win. We're concerned. There's a lot of anxiety, I think, about what the political landscape is going to look like, if not the day after, soon afterwards. And regardless of who wins, I can tell you what it will be like the day after the election. God will still be God. He will still be sovereign. And the God of peace will Himself be in perfect peace. He won't be caught off guard. He won't be found in heaven wringing His hands Wondering, ay, 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 what am I going to do now? What am I going to do with Hillary or the Donald? How are we going to get out of this mess? There'll be no urgent meetings of archangels, no fear, no frustration, no fatalism, because God is God and God is sovereign. The Republicans cannot put God into power, and the Democrats can't keep him out. God is going to do what God has planned to do, and votes and voters will not thwart his sovereign plans for this world. God can use anybody in that White House. God used Pharaoh. And any person who puts their faith, their absolute faith, In politicians or political parties, I'm sorry, but you need a wake-up call. You are naive. You are misguided. You are destined for disappointment and disillusionment. The Apostle Paul has just spent some precious time in the previous chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, reminding the Corinthians of the sovereignty of God as it is seen in his church. And he uses words of divine manipulation 
in the most positive sense of the word. In verse 18, he talks about how in his church, God has arranged. In verse 24, God has combined or put together. In verse 28, God has appointed. Now in chapter 15, he will speak of God's sovereignty in the world. And in verse 24 and 25, he will, Paul says, Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. That is inevitable. That is where we are going. That is how this will all play out. God's not asleep at the will. He hasn't forgotten us. He hasn't forgotten His promises. God's not over the hill. He's not one of those aged, clueless, out-of-step leaders that we are sometimes burdened with. He is ageless. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. People have always tried to put him out of business. Do you remember the God is dead movement? You young people wouldn't, but some of us would. The God is dead movement. I thought some preacher had a great response. He said, God's not dead. He's not even sick. And he's not. God knows exactly, precisely what's going on. In fact, he knew it before it happened. He already knows the end from the beginning. He knew that from the foundations of the world before the worlds were laid. He knows who's going to win the election, and guess what? He's ready for it. Our faith is not in man or man's ideologies, and may I add, or woman's. If that's all we had, I'd say run for the hills. Find a cave and live out your life like a hermit. But our faith is not in politicians. It's not in governments, kings or queens. Our faith is in God and God alone. He's not our last refuge. He's our only refuge. Faith in God. Secondly, hope. Hope from God. God has delivered to us a great hope. Verse 13, now these three remain faith and hope. Now we use that word hope, all kind of nuances. We, we hope for good people. We hope for good government. We hope for wise, compassionate, and effective leadership. We hope for a thoughtful and conscientious citizenry. We hope for better times, but that's kind of a hope so. It's a survival mechanism. It's how we cope. But our real hope, our no-so hope, our unshakable confidence is not in anything in this world. Our political season has reached the point of absurdity. It's the season that seems to be without end. From one political cycle right into the next. Officially, we go now about two years running for office, and it gets longer every national election. Canada goes for seven months, and they seem to get it right about as often as we do. (laughs) It's too long, it costs way too much money, and nobody seemingly has the brains or the courage to try to rein it in. Millions and millions of dollars are spent on the presidential race, and I think I read the other day that Hillary Clinton alone raised a billion dollars in the presidential race. The media, our beloved media, goes into obsessive, compulsive behavior, parsing every word, interpreting every nuance of the candidates. It's amusing and also annoying to watch CNN with nine experts who probably don't know any more than anybody in this room 
sitting around a table sharing their wisdom about the upcoming election. Nine people. It's enough to drive any man crazy, and I'm right on the edge. If I can only hold out for two more days, I think I'll hole up in the house. Endless political ads are sent into our homes reminding us how evil and unqualified the other candidate is. It's a bizarre world. It's an altered state of reality that's mind-bending. And believe me, there are people lying in wait already formulating their strategies for 2020. So it's kind of hard to see beyond all this. You get caught up in it. But the Christian must always see beyond this. We have a dual citizenship. Our hope and our home are in heaven. Nowhere to be found on earth. Not in the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, the Independent Party, the Green Party. We have an overriding hope that extends beyond this life and into the next. We believe there is an eternity, and we not only believe it, we live like it. We believe there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. In chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians here, Paul spends the bulk of the chapter writing about what? Our hope. Jesus rose from the dead, and because He lives, we're going to live with Him. Someday a trumpet is going to sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Someday this mortal will put on immortality. Someday death will be swallowed up in victory. So yes, be involved. Look at the situation. Study the options. Pray over your responsibilities. Vote your conscience. But don't stop there. Look past this life Look past the voting booth. Look past the presidential candidate. Look past the political party because it's all going to go by so quickly. And what you think is so important will one day fade away. What you think is so durable will one day collapse. And what you think is so deserving of your most intense efforts can come back to mock you. Faith, but not in this world. Hope, but not from this world or anything in this world. Thirdly, love. The love of God. Verse 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. I can't believe how willing we have been to allow this to become a divisive, dividing issue among us. Now, in our nation, I may be understandable, but it's beyond sad when it's brother against brother in the church, and preachers and prophets are rising up and asserting themselves into the limelight on both sides. And people get overly sensitive and judgmental and defensive and easily offended and angry. Give just the slightest hint that you're on the wrong side, that you support the wrong candidate or candidates. And I'll tell you, some people are ready to write you off right on the spot. Then they demonize you, they gossip about you, and then they misrepresent you to others. We put politics before the virtues of the kingdom. We put politics before faith, hope, and love. We take sides and we make each other's political persuasions paramount. The acid test, the criterion of our friendship even our Christian love. Cal Thomas wrote a book, co-authored a book called Blinded by Might. 
He talks about that a lot. He kind of got burned in this whole thing, learned the lesson the hard way and began to see it a little differently than when he had been such an advocate for the religious right, even though he still believes in their tenets. But he was putting his eggs in the wrong basket. And he came to the conclusion that we end up fighting the wrong battle on the wrong field with the wrong weapons. How foolish to make something so temporal more important than something so eternal. These three remain, faith, hope, and love. I'm all for passion in the political arena. I'm all for it. It's the American way. But I wish I saw as much passion for what's in God's Word as I do in the planks of the political parties. I wish I saw as much passion and enthusiasm for these three virtues, faith, hope, and charity. And I'll tell you, it's not easy walking through that minefield as a pastor today. Pastor, gets, he gets pulled in every imaginable direction. <clears throat> People are having a tug of war at his expense. Not just him, but any pastor today. And pastor, as far as I'm concerned, you have, you have played this thing out just right. You have navigated through the political season. You have said the things, and you have not said the things just the way I would have done it, so it has to be right. It just has to be. <laughs> Frankly, my dear, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, what I'm more concerned about is, are you a Christian? The greatest of these is not being right. The greatest of these is not winning. The greatest of these is not being in power. The greatest of these is love. How many believe that's still true? even in an election year. Well, I know a sermon like this must have a short shelf life. After Tuesday, it may seem to be irrelevant, but not really. I can bring it out the next time there's an election. I have a feeling it's going to be needed then as much as it is now. I just wanted to put that in perspective for you this heated political season and to remind you that it too will pass. Faith, hope, and love will not. Faith, hope, and love, no matter who wins, no matter who loses, faith, hope, and love, this side of the election, faith, hope, and love, the other side of the election, faith, hope, and love, faith in God, hope from God, love of God, faith, hope, and love. Don't leave home without them. Don't forget them. I'd like for us to end our service tonight by having prayer. And I think we have a lot to pray about, and I think the pump is primed, and we are ready to pray about these front burner issues that, we have, that, that we've been dealing with and groping with and trying to work through praying for our nation, praying for our leaders, praying for the election, praying for peace, as Pastor Jeff just did a moment ago, praying for our future, the, the future society our young people will live in, will inherit, will be given to them by our generation. Would you stand with me? And can I invite you, please, uh, Christian first, an American second. But can I invite you as a, an American who is a Christian first to just come, stand with me here at the front of the church, and let's end this service tonight with some prayers offered to God, some intercessory prayer, praying for all of these matters that have 
just been suggested this evening. Praying that uh, we can abide by these three virtues, faith, hope, and love. There may be Republicans and Democrats here tonight, but I trust we can all be brothers and sisters in the Lord's family, and that we'd lay down our life for one another. We'd serve one another. And that political persuasion fades into the background compared to our calling as believers. We may be Republicans or Democrats or Independents, whatever, for a few years, but we are Christians forever. We are brothers and sisters forever. Let's be reminded of those things tonight.